Uh, origin stories. We firmly believe that we are, we were one of the first uh, U.S. archaeology anthropology museums to have a conservation lab staffed by professional conservators. Um, I think there are those, perhaps even one or two in this group who would dispute that, but what's a good origin story without an aspect of mythology? So that's our story and we're sticking to it. Um, and we can actually date the day that the very first artifact entered the conservation lab on September 21st, 1966. Um, for you youngins, it used to be before we had databases and all those things, everything was written out longhand in a ledger, okay? So we kept a ledger, or the lab kept a ledger, and these first few objects came in on September 21st, um, and from the Near East section, you can see them if you go up to our Canaan and Ancient Israel Gallery, they're still there. We did make some progress over the years. Um, this is a 1998 treatment report um, with the wonders of word processing, and within the next five years, I fully expect that that artifact will be re reconserved um, to go into our new Crossroads Gallery, and there will be a wonderful database generated treatment report. But the early days of the lab was really devoted to um, treatment. There was very, as far as we can tell from the records, very little interaction between the lab and the rest of the museum except via artifacts. And that really changed um, starting in 1978 when Ginny Green began taking a much more active role in preventive conservation. Um, she did, in 1978, a storeroom survey. As you can see from the left of the screen, um, it needed it. <laughs> Our storerooms were very crowded and full of wooden uh, shelving and things were just kind of piled on. And uh, by the time Ginny retired in 2008, our storerooms, many of them look like this. We're still working. It's an ongoing process. In fact, uh, tomorrow afternoon, Alexis North and her colleagues will be telling you about the preliminary stages of planning our next gallery renovation, which will be the Egyptian collections. Um, so Ginny is, is really the one who set the, the lab on the road to success, and it's little wonder that in, 2001, the American Institute for Conservation honored her with their Caroline and Sheldon Keck Award for Sustained Excellence in the Training of Conservation Professionals. So Jenny's here. Let's give her a round of applause. I find it a little disconcerting that between Ginny and I, we span 46 of the labs 50 years. Uh, we come, we stay. <laughs> but our whole team is very proud to be continuing that uh, tradition. Our records show that over the last 50 years, we've had, come on, you can do it. At least 90 fellows and interns in our lab. Um, many of them have gone on to success elsewhere in the conservation realm and museums. Um, they've spent time in our lab getting experience with all too real life. And um, our success can be counted in the various ways that many of our former interns have gone on to illustrious careers. And the fact that this list reads sort of like a who's who in archaeological and ethnographic conservation. And I am especially proud that eight of the presenters in this um, symposium are former interns of ours. Um, but we're not resting on our laurels. Um, we, with major support from 
the museum's executive team, and especially our director of development and fairy godmother. Um, the department has grown exponentially over the last five years um, in staffing, programming, and facilities. We have wonderful new labs, which are closely associated with the Center for the Analysis of Archaeological Materials, which you'll be hearing about later this morning. And we've grown from the two-person staff that it was when I arrived in 1988 to our current strength of three staff conservators, five project conservators, two part-time conservation technicians, and of course, one curriculum intern and two pre-program interns. So one thing that this generous staffing has made me appreciate is that what can happen, the wonderful things that can happen when you reach a critical conservation mass or a critical conservator mass. One thing that happens is there's always a lot of food involved. <laughs> but we have a lot of really fertile discussions. And whether it's over lunch or just gathering in the office or in meetings, um, our discussions are um, usually lively and always informative and frequently pretty funny. Um, but I had noticed that some uh, topics sort of rose to the top repeatedly, and one of them was, you know, why aren't there more good, little good themed conferences? The way there are, uh, there have been a couple of them that have been really good. We were constantly going back and looking at the CCI 1986 Ethnographic Conference as a landmark. Um, Emily, who Williams is here, has put on some great ones at Colonial Williamsburg. But there's so often we're looking at the meetings list and if there's a two-day conference on a really interesting topic and you think, gosh, I'd love to go to that. And it's in England. It's always in England. <laughs> so when we were looking at how to celebrate our 50th anniversary, this is something that sort of rose to the top. And so this is our second um, uh, origin myth of how this came up. So we decided to have a symposium and we talked to our um, boss, the head of collections, Jim Matthew. And he, despite some reservations about whether we could handle this or not with everything else that's going on in our lives, um, sponsored us to get funding from the Kowalski Family Foundation. And it's thanks to that that we're able to provide support for many of the speakers. Um, and this couldn't have happened without the cooperation of all the conservation team, but I really want to call out Nina Ofcharik and Molly Gleason, who have done the bulk of the organization and cat herding and all of that, and they've done a wonderful job keeping us all organized and getting everything together. Um, when we started out, we had, we couldn't quite settle on a theme. We had about four different themes floating around in the ether. And um, so we put out a very broad call for papers. And we were a little worried because, you know, it was two weeks before the deadline and there were very few papers in. They were good, but there were very few of them. And then suddenly the deluge happened and we were inundated with really wonderful papers. And so many that we couldn't possibly accept them all, even though some of them were absolutely fabulous. So what we did to make our jobs a little easier is we sort of started looking at them and seeing if some patterns emerged. And um, we settled with five different themes for the symposium. Um, that you'll be experiencing over the next two and a half days. So the sessions are engaging education, engaging archaeology, engaging community, engaging institutions, and engaging science. These are least, uh, loose categories, and many of the papers could easily go into more than one session. Um, but we're thrilled to be able to present so many fine examples of collaboration, between conservators and allied professionals, and we hope you, that you'll find this symposium a rewarding experience. I'm sorry, there will no be. <laughs> <laughs>
will, will not be cake. <laughs>